Love and Friendship by Jane Austen. Part three. Letter the fourteenth. Laura in continuation. Arm yourself, my amiable young friend, with all the philosophy you are mistress of. Summon up all the fortitude you possess. For alas, in the perusal of the following pages, your sensibility will be most severely tried. Ah, what were the misfortunes I had before experienced, and which I have already related to you, to the one I am now going to inform you of? The death of my father, and my mother, and my husband, though almost more than my gentle nature could support, were trifles in comparison to the misfortune I am now proceeding to relate. The morning after our arrival at the cottage, Sophia complained of a violent pain in her delicate limbs, accompanied with a disagreeable headache. She attributed it to a cold caught by her continued faintings in the open air, as the dew was falling the evening before. This I feared was but too probably the case, since how could it otherwise be accounted for that I should have escaped the same indisposition, but by supposing that the bodily exertions I had undergone, in my repeated fits of frenzy, had so effectively circulated and warmed my blood, as to make me proof against the chilling damps of night. Whereas Sophia, lying totally inactive on the ground, must have been exposed to all their severity. I was most seriously alarmed by her illness, which, trifling as it may appear to you, a certain instinctive sensibility whispered me, would in the end be fatal to her. Alas! My fears were but too fully justified. She grew gradually worse, and I daily became more alarmed for her. At length she was obliged to confine herself solely to the bed allotted us by our worthy landlady. Her disorder turned to a galloping consumption, and in a few days carried her off. Amidst all my lamentations for her, and violent you may suppose they were, I yet received some consolation in the reflection of my having paid every attention to her that could be offered in her illness. I had wept over her every day, had bathed her sweet face with my tears, and had pressed her fair hands continually in mine. My beloved Laura, said she, a few hours before she died, take warning from my unhappy end, and avoid the imprudent conduct which had occasioned it. Beware of fainting fits, though at the time they may be refreshing and agreeable, Yet believe me, they will in the end, if too often repeated, and at improper seasons, prove destructive to your constitution. My fate will teach you this. I die a martyr to my grief for the loss of Augustus. One fatal swoon has cost me my life. Beware of swoons, dear Laura. A frenzy fit is not one quarter so pernicious. It is an exercise to the body, and if not too violent, is, I dare say, conducive to health in its consequences. Run mad as often as you choose, but do not faint." These were the last words she ever addressed to me. It was her dying advice to her afflicted Laura, who has ever most faithfully adhered to it. After having attended my lamented friend to her early grave, I immediately, though late at night, left the detested village in which she died and near which had expired my husband and Augustus. I had not walked many yards from it, before I was overtaken by a stage-coach, in which I instantly took a place, determined to proceed in it to Edinburgh, where I hoped to find some kind, some pitying friend, who would receive and comfort me in my afflictions. It was so dark when I entered the coach, that I could not distinguish the number of my fellow-travellers, I could only perceive that they were many. Regardless, however, of anything concerning them, I gave myself up to my own sad reflections. A general silence prevailed, a silence which was by nothing interrupted, but by the loud and repeated snores of one of the party. What an illiterate villain must that man be, thought I to myself. What a total want of delicate refinement must he have, who can thus shock our senses by such a brutal noise. He must, I am certain, be capable of every bad action. There is no crime too black for such a character." Thus reasoned I within myself, and doubtless such were the reflections of my fellow-travellers. At length, returning day enabled me to behold the unprincipled scoundrel who had so violently disturbed my feelings. 
it was Sir Edward, the father of my deceased husband. By his side sat Augusta, and on the same seat with me were your mother and Lady Dorothea. Imagine my surprise at finding myself thus seated amongst my old acquaintance. Great as was my astonishment, it was yet increased, when on looking out of windows, I beheld the husband of Philippa, with Philippa by his side, on the coach-box, and when on looking behind I beheld Philander and Gustavus in the basket. "'Oh, heavens!' exclaimed I. "'Is it possible that I should so unexpectedly be surrounded by my nearest relations and connections?' These words roused the rest of the party, and every eye was directed to the corner in which I sat. "'Oh, my Isabel!' continued I, throwing myself across Lady Dorothea into her arms. "'Receive once more to your bosom the unfortunate Laura. Alas! when last we parted in the Vale of Usk, I was happy in being united to the best of Edwards. I had then a father and mother, and had never known misfortunes. But now, deprived of every friend but you—' "'What?' interrupted Augusta. "'Is my brother dead, then? Tell us, I entreat you, what is become of him.' Yes, cold and insensible nymph, replied I, that luckless swain your brother is no more, and you may now glory in being the heiress of Sir Edward's fortune. Although I had always despised her from the day I had overheard her conversation with my Edward, yet in civility I complied with hers and Sir Edward's entreaties that I would inform them of the whole melancholy affair. They were greatly shocked. Even the obdurate heart of Sir Edward and the insensible one of Augusta, were touched with sorrow by the unhappy tale. At the request of your mother, I related to them every other misfortune which had befallen me since we parted, of the imprisonment of Augustus, and the absence of Edward, of our arrival in Scotland, of our unexpected meeting with our grandfather and our cousins, of our visit to Macdonald Hall, of the singular service we there performed towards Ginetta, of her father's ingratitude for it, of his inhuman behaviour, unaccountable suspicions, and barbarous treatment of us, in obliging us to leave the house, of our lamentations on the loss of Edward and Augustus, and finally, of the melancholy death of my beloved companion. Pity and surprise were strongly depictured in your mother's countenance during the whole of my narration, but I am sorry to say that to the eternal reproach of her sensibility the latter infinitely predominated. Nay, faultless as my conduct had certainly been during the whole course of my late misfortunes and adventures, she pretended to find fault with my behaviour in many of the situations in which I had been placed. As I was sensible myself that I had always behaved in a manner which reflected honour on my feelings and refinement, I paid little attention to what she said, and desired her to satisfy my curiosity by informing me how she came there, instead of wounding my spotless reputation with unjustifiable reproaches. As soon as she had complied with my wishes in this particular, and had given me an accurate detail of everything that had befallen her since our separation, the particulars of which, if you are not already acquainted with, your mother will give you, I applied to Augusta for the same information, respecting herself, Sir Edward, and Lady Dorothea. She told me that having a considerable taste for the beauties of nature, her curiosity to behold the wonderful scenes it exhibited in that part of the world, had been so much raised by Gilpin's tour to the Highlands, that she had prevailed on her father to undertake a tour to Scotland, and had persuaded Lady Dorothea to accompany them, that they had arrived at Edinburgh a few days before, and from thence had made daily excursions into the country around, in the stage-coach they were then in from one of which excursions they were at that time returning. My next inquiries were concerning Philippa and her husband, the latter of whom I learned, having spent all her fortune, had recourse for subsistence to the talent in which he had always most excelled, namely driving, and that, having sold everything which belonged to them except their coach, had converted it into a stage, and in order to be removed from any of his former acquaintance, had driven it to Edinburgh, from whence he went to Stirling every other day. That Philippa, still retaining her affection for her ungrateful husband, had followed him to Scotland, and generally accompanied him in his little excursions to Stirling. 
It has only been to throw a little money into their pockets, continued Augusta, that my father has always travelled in their coach to view the beauties of the country since our arrival in Scotland, for it would certainly have been much more agreeable to us to visit the Highlands in a post-chase than merely to travel from Edinburgh to Stirling and from Stirling to Edinburgh every other day in a crowded and uncomfortable stage. I perfectly agreed with her in her sentiments on the affair, and secretly blamed Sir Edward for thus sacrificing his daughter's pleasure for the sake of a ridiculous old woman whose folly in marrying so young a man ought to be punished. His behaviour, however, was entirely of a piece with his general character, for what could be expected from a man who possessed not the smallest atom of sensibility, who scarcely knew the meaning of sympathy, and who actually snored? Adieu, Laura. Letter the fifteenth, Laura, in continuation. When we arrived at the town where we were to breakfast, I was determined to speak with Philander and Gustavus, and to that purpose, as soon as I left the carriage, I went to the basket, and tenderly inquired after their health, expressing my fears of the uneasiness of their situation. At first they seemed rather confused at my appearance, dreading no doubt that I might call them to account, for the money which our grandfather had left me, and which they had unjustly deprived me of. But finding that I mentioned nothing of the matter, they desired me to step into the basket, as we might there converse with greater ease. Accordingly I entered and whilst the rest of the party were devouring green tea and buttered toast, we feasted ourselves in a more refined and sentimental manner, by a confidential conversation. I informed them of everything which had befallen me during the course of my life, and at my request they related to me every incident of theirs. We are the sons, as you already know, of the two youngest daughters which Lord Sinclair had by Lorena, an Italian opera girl. Our mothers could neither of them exactly ascertain who were our father, though it is generally believed that Philander is the son of one Philip Jones, a bricklayer, and that my father was one Gregory Staves, a staymaker of Edinburgh. This is, however, of little consequence, for as our mothers were certainly never married to either of them, it reflects no dishonour on our blood, which is of a most ancient and unpolluted kind. Bertha, the mother of Philander, and Agatha, my own mother, always lived together, they were neither of them very rich. Their united fortunes had originally amounted to nine thousand pounds, but as they had always lived on the principle of it, when we were fifteen it was diminished to nine hundred. This nine hundred they always kept in a drawer in one of the tables, which stood in our common sitting parlour, for the convenience of having it always at hand. Whether it was from this circumstance, of it being easily taken, or from a wish of being independent, or from an excess of sensibility, for which we were always remarkable, I cannot now determine. But certain it is, that when we had reached our fifteenth year, we took the nine hundred pounds, and ran away. Having obtained this prize, we were determined to manage it with economy, and not to spend it with either folly or extravagance. To this purpose, we therefore divided it into nine parcels, one of which we devoted to victuals, the second to drink, the third to housekeeping, the fourth to carriages, the fifth to horses, the sixth to servants, the seventh to amusements, the eighth to clothes, and the ninth to silver buckles. Having thus arranged our expenses for two months, for we expected to make the nine hundred pounds last as long, we hastened to London, and had the good luck to spend it in seven weeks and a day, which was six days sooner than we had intended. As soon as we had thus happily disencumbered ourselves from the weight of so much money, we began to think of returning to our mothers. But accidentally hearing that they were both starved to death, we gave over the design, and determined to engage ourselves to some strolling company of players, as we had always had a turn for the stage. Accordingly, we offered our services to one, and were accepted. Our company was indeed rather small, as it consisted only of the manager, his wife, and ourselves. But there were fewer to pay, and the only inconvenience attending it was the scarcity of plays, which for want of people to fill the characters we could perform. We did not mind trifles, however. One of our most admired performances was Macbeth, in which we were truly great. The manager always played Banquo himself, his wife, my Lady Macbeth, I did the three witches, and Philander acted all the rest. To say the truth, this tragedy was not only the best, 
but the only play that we ever performed, and after having acted it all over England and Wales, we came to Scotland to exhibit it over the remainder of Great Britain. We happened to be quartered in that very town, where you came and met your grandfather. We were in the inn-yard when his carriage entered, and perceiving by the arms to whom it belonged, and knowing that Lord Sinclair was our grandfather, we agreed to endeavour to get something from him by discovering the relationship. You know how well it succeeded. Having obtained the two hundred pounds, we instantly left the town, leaving our manager and his wife to act Macbeth by themselves, and took the road to Stirling, where we spent our little fortune with great eclat. We are now returning to Edinburgh, in order to get some preferment in the acting way, and such, my dear cousin, is our history." I thanked the amiable youth for his entertaining narration, and after expressing my wishes for their welfare and happiness, left them in their little habitation, and returned to my other friends, who impatiently expected me. My adventures are now drawing to a close, my dearest Marianne, at least for the present. When we arrived at Edinburgh, Sir Edward told me that, as the widow of his son, he desired I would accept from his hands of four hundred a year. I graciously promised that I would, but could not help observing that the unsympathetic baronet offered it more on account of my being the widow of Edward than in being the refined and amiable Laura. I took up my residence in a romantic village in the highlands of Scotland, where I have ever since continued, and where I can, uninterrupted by unmeaning visits, indulge in a melancholy solitude, my unceasing lamentations for the death of my father, my mother, my husband, and my friend. Augusta has been for several years united to Graham, the man of all others most suited to her. She became acquainted with him during her stay in Scotland. Sir Edward, in hopes of gaining an heir to his title and estate, at the same time married Lady Dorothea. His wishes have been answered. Philander and Gustavus, after having raised their reputation by their performances in the theatrical line at Edinburgh, removed to Covent Garden, where they still exhibit under the assumed names of Lewis and Quick. Philippa has long paid the debt of nature. Her husband, however, still continues to drive the stagecoach from Edinburgh to Stirling. Adieu, my dearest Marianne. Laura. Finney. June 13th, 1790. End of Part 3 and End of Love and Friendship by Jane Austen. The music included in this recording is from Schubert's Fantasy in C Major, played by Daniel Blanche, available from museopen.org. M-U-S-O-P-E-N dot O-R-G.